Hello and welcome back to Not Overthinking. Tamil, how are you doing today? Doing pretty well. I actually just got off a call with uh, one of the Not Overthinking members who's going to be helping us out with some community organizing and that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, that was really good fun. He's in Singapore where they have to do like a two-year military service stint between secondary school, high school and university. And yeah, we were kind of talking about this. I, it always, my, my friends at university who were from Singapore they so sort of struck me as like a lot more mature. I mean, they're like two years older, so that's part of it. But I think also like having this two year period where you're outside of the education bubble just seems like a really valuable thing because for, you know, people like us, you just kind of go through school, which is very much like a, a bubble of being surrounded by people exactly your age, thinking exactly the same things as you. And then like immediately you go into university, which, you know, there's a bit, you know, maybe you interact with, slightly older people a little bit but you know broadly you you're sort of stuck in this bubble of people exactly the same age as you thinking exactly the same things as you and having this sort of two-year stint in between high school and university where you're out of that bubble in the real world interacting with people of all ages you know and, and so on it just seems like a really valuable thing what do you reckon yeah one of my uh one of my mates from med school <laughs> was also is also singaporean was like three years older than all of us and yeah <laughs> uh, i'm not sure i'm more mature but <laughs> like, i think like, i think it is it is like a valuable thing to do yeah i guess it, it depends what you mean by mature like i think so, you know there's like a an interpretation of maturity which i think is very like not even surface level of like you know oh you don't laugh at like certain jokes anymore because you're mature or whatever that's not really what i'm talking about i mean the thing that this chap was mentioning was that um, I think he's coming towards the end of his two year stint and it's just been like a couple of years of sort of staring into the void and trying to figure out what you want from life and, and like, you know, all, all of this kind of stuff. Uh, and I think there's a level of maturity that comes with that. Whereas if you're stuck in the education industrial complex without any breaks, then I don't think you really get that opportunity, um, to, to the same extent. And you're not, you don't really have to think for yourself at all. The path is just yeah. kind of laid out for you everyone else is doing stuff you want the validation of your peers and you're kind of doing the same things and so on yeah this is something so i was i, w I was talking to our friend paul who is my singaporean friend like about, about this yesterday uh we were we, we, we were just catching up and spitballing ideas around you know the, this question of how do you figure out what to do with your life um which i'm a trying to figure out myself and b trying to figure out a framework for writing in the book and one thing that he said, which was very interesting, was that he he said that you want to think about what's the playbook and, and, and is there a playbook for the, for the area of life in which you're currently at? So I think when you're in school and you're, let's say, a nerd in school, the playbook is I want to get really good grades so I can get to a, a really good university. And it's a pretty clear path, path forward, like you know what you have to do to get there. Yeah. When you're at university, you know, or like certainly if you're a medical student, the playbook is I need to get through my exams. I need to try and do somewhat well. I need to maybe rack up a publication or two so I can optimize my chances to get a decent foundation year job six years down the line. When you're in that foundation year job, the playbook is, OK, I need to make it through the next two years and decide what specialty to do. And so uh, at, at each of these junctures, there's a very clear part, like yellow brick road laid out in front of you. And what he was saying to me is that it's like, 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 even though I've kind of gone slightly away from the medicine thing and more towards this being a creator thing, he was saying that there is a playbook for the being a creator thing as well. It's you build an audience, you start off by repurposing other people's stuff. You maybe do some original insights of your own. You do YouTube, you get different platforms. Eventually you write a book and then you become an angel investor and then you start doing the speaking gigs. And yeah. it's like <laughs> the, the playbook of the internet creator, entrepreneur, guru type thing. Yeah. And so what he was saying is that what I'm thinking about, what I'm thinking, like, how do I actually want to design my life? If I do want to straddle these worlds of medicine and the internet, that is, there, there isn't really a playbook for that because very few people do that. Whereas if I want to go entirely one way or the other, there is a very clear playbook to follow. And so when you're in this sort of being pulled in multiple directions with, with multiple interests, you have to do a lot more original thinking about like, what do I actually want to do? And what do I want my life to look like without yeah. just blindly following the path laid out in front of you? Yeah, for sure. How do we get onto that? Oh yeah, um, Singaporean friend. 
Oh, yeah. and spe speaking of blindly following the path laid out in front of you, this episode is brought to you by none other than Skillshare. I'm not sure why I used that as a segue. Uh, Skillshare, if you guys haven't heard by now, is a fantastic online platform with thousands of online classes covering all sorts of topics from design and illustration to business management, productivity, studying for exams. Uh, if you hit the link in the video description or you go to skillshare.com forward slash not overthinking pod, then you can have access to all of my classes on Skillshare. There's like eight of them right now, and we're working on a ninth, which is coming out in two weeks time. I've got two themed around productivity, two themed around how to study for your exams, and one themed around how to be happier, taking lessons from stoicism. So if you'd like to sign up to Skillshare and support the podcast, then head over to skillshare.com forward slash not overthinking pod, and that will give you a free trial. And at the end of the free trial, the annual premium subscription is, is less than $10 a month. That is so much better for you than Netflix is, and you can genuinely learn a ton of really interesting stuff on Skillshare. So skillshare.com forward slash not overthinking pod, or hit the link in the video description. So thank you, Skillshare, for sponsoring this episode. Nice. How has uh, how has your week been, Ali? Hmm. How's my week been? I often have to look at my calendar when I'm doing this until I've done my weekly review. Broadly, broadly the week has been pretty good. It was a bit of a stressful day on a Friday, Whoa. where there were just like a few different things that piled up with like the YouTuber Academy course that where where that we're in the middle of. Um, we had like a few kind of back channel grumblings where there was there was some some level of chinese whispering that hey some people weren't kind of finding some aspects of the course as valuable as they would have liked or as valuable as they were hyped uh and so me and angus were like tearing our hair out being like what the hell's going on like how do we solve this and like really kind of <laughs> i think probably i went a bit over the top in trying to think oh my god this is a problem we need to solve it and then i was chatting to some friends uh and a business associates and they were like look people are always going to do some level of back channel grumbling and you can't read into it too much. Like if you've given the space for people to actually give you feedback mm. and no one has done it, <laughs> then you don't need to worry about back channel grumbling because it's just always going to happen. It's just how people are. And you don't want to, for example, if two people are just being like, oh, hey, this session wasn't, wasn't as useful as last session was, you don't want to try and fix things mid-flight, even though it's not a problem for like 99% of other people. Right, yeah. Um, and so there was a, a little bit of a stressful day in that, yeah, all these, these, these various things were piling up. But broadly, the week has been pretty chill beyond that. So what, when you say this back channel grumbling, like what's the extent of it? Is it like, oh, that lesson wasn't, was still really good, but not as good as last week's or? Um, it was like, oh, well, you know, so like, well, like one of our students who we're kind of tight with says that, oh yeah, I was, I was DMing one or two of the other students and they were like, yeah, these particular types of sessions that we've been having haven't necessarily been haven't been as useful for like intermediate YouTubers because they seem more focused towards beginners. And, you know, as intermediate YouTubers, we feel like we're not getting huge value from these sessions because they're run by other kind of beginners mm -hmm. um, and that kind of stuff. And so I was being like, uh, I think it's easy to read too much into that and say that, oh my God, we're not catering to intermediate YouTubers at all. Um, and so we've added stuff to more directly cater to intermediate, intermediate YouTubers. I think uh, some, some, some aspect of it was also, I think just lack of clarity around what certain sessions are. So we have like these things called alumni supporter sessions, which are just a sort of rock up and have a chat and share any struggles and things like that. But right. because it's billed as that, like rock up and have a chat and share any struggles, like that's very nebulous. Like there isn't a clear, like what is the point of these sessions? Yeah. Whereas if we were to say that, look, these are sessions focused at beginners who are struggling with the, I don't know, with various aspects of being a YouTuber and you can chat with other beginners in the community, it becomes a lot more obvious. And so intermediate YouTubers will be like, okay, cool. It's not for me. That's fine. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. So why um, did you feel stressed about that? Um, I mean, it was, it was that and like one or two other sort of minor, minor grumbles um, that like we don't usually have any grumbling at all and so like <laughs> zero okay. grumbling to sort of some grumbling felt like like a big change and I was like oh my god what are we doing wrong here yeah um, so I think that was what led partly to the the fact that that felt a bit a little bit stressful okay that's fair you win some you lose some exactly I started uh, taking my, my my blog more seriously <laughs> this week mm. and it's been very fun 
who was it? I was I had a chat with someone. Oh, I had a chat with my storytelling coach, Matthew Dix, who uh, wrote my, my favorite book of 2020 called Story Worthy, which is all about how to become a better storyteller. And we were chatting and he apparently has, well, he has been writing a blog post every day since 2003. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, mental. And some of these are quite short, obviously, but he says that, yeah, each morning I just, you know, I, I, I think of a prompt like, I re recently I've been thinking about X and then I just write about it for half an hour and I just publish it on my blog. And he was saying like, there was like one day, like three months ago where his daughter said, daddy, you haven't published a blog post. And he was like, I definitely have I've been doing it every day since 2003. Yeah. And he, and he thought that he hadn't pressed the publish button and he had loads of oh. emails from people being like, oh my God, like, where are you? We thought you were dead. Like the fact <laughs> that you didn't publish the blog post. Yeah. Um, the other cool thing that Matthew does is that every month, like every, every year he like defines his like 50 or so goals for the year. And every month he does like a goals update where he just kind of shares his progress in each of these goals. I just found okay. that like really, really, really inspiring because I looked through his list and it was, it was like an interesting list of goals. And some of them he succeeded at, some of them he failed at. And he said his hit rate, his success rate is around about 60%. And he said the real value in those goal sharing posts is the fact that it holds him accountable but it also helps the audience, like the readers for his, of his blog, like it, it kind of normalizes failure. And so he gets a lot of emails from readers saying that, yeah, I love reading your blog posts each month because they help, they make me realize that failing at your goals is okay. And that's not the end of the world. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's like, yeah. yeah, that's, that, that's definitely an idea worth sharing. So like that night after my session with Matthew, I just sort of, you know, sat on the sofa with like this burst of inspiration and I sort of banged out <laughs> a, a blog post about like, <laughs> why I'm taking blogging more seriously and then banged out another one about like my goals for my March 2021 goals update. Yeah. Which has actually been like the most read post on a website for the last like week and people seem to be really nice. liking it. And I was having a chat with um, some other mutual friends just catching up with them and like one of them was like, oh yeah, you know, I read your blog post and it was, it was, it was really interesting. And I was like, oh my God, you actually read my blog post. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's such a nice feeling when someone says that they actually, yeah, yeah. <laughs> actually read the blog or listen to the podcast or like watch the videos. Yeah. But not in the, in the extent that, like, it's, I find it even more flattering when it's just casually mentioned that, oh, in that video, like, last week, you said X. And be like, oh, my God, <laughs> you actually watched it? <laughs> so, yeah. I, fi I find that flattering, but also offensive. I think I tweeted about this, and maybe I've brought it up on the podcast. But if someone I know in real life, like, listens to the podcast or reads some of my stuff and then doesn't tell me about it until, until a lot later on, mm. I find it very intrusive. <laughs> it's like... Why would you listen to me for two hours in your ear and not drop me a message to say, hey, I'm listening to your podcast, man. <laughs> like, why would you do that? What a weird thing to do. This is yeah, partly why I, I, I make a point to comment on all my YouTuber friends' videos when if I've, if I've seen seen the entirety of it. Yeah. <laughs> because it otherwise it just seems a bit snaky. Like. <laughs> yeah, it seems, it's snaky. It seems almost deceitful. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I have a right to privacy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I read your blog. I, I, I read your blog post. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Thanks for letting me know. <laughs> a solid five days later. Um, yeah, I sort of skimmed it. Um, and I, yeah, I thought it was quite interesting that it seemed like for at least half of the goals, you were just like, yeah, I haven't really been doing this or whatever. Um, I think the abs won, the wife won. Yeah, there were a few others. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> just thought I'd make a list of goals, things that I want to get done in the year. I didn't really follow any kind of smart goal framework for them or anything like that. Because partly I don't really care about that, 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 that sort of stuff. But it was just quite nice having, sort of writing down this like 2,500 word thing. I was like, oh yeah, these are my goals. And, this, and now I've got it kind of codified on the internet. And so in a way it makes it easier for me to know what I'm working on. Yeah. Like the fact that it's written down somewhere public. Interesting. I thought the uh, I thought the way that you announced the blog post was particularly interesting, and I'd mm. like to talk about that Certainly. somewhat. Uh, let me let me bring up the tweet. Bring up the tweet. <sighs> Can we just talk about your little video clips that you tweet on Twitter? What's oh, the yeah. point of them? Do, does they do, do they do anything for you? It just seems to like clutter up your your tweets with. I don't I mean, know. I, I did a Drivel. I did a Twitter poll, and like eighty five percent of people said they they like them. So oh, like, okay, yeah. fine, fine. I'm not a fan of them personally, but <laughs> like when I see other people doing clips like that, I mostly ignore it. But occasionally, I'm like, oh, okay, this is interesting. I'll watch it. 
And then I think, huh, it's interesting that I actually watched this clip because normally I would ignore it. And like, if he hadn't put this clip out there, I wouldn't have gotten this piece of this, this nugget or whatever. Yeah. And so I feel like, oh yeah, I'm glad you do this, even though like maybe I only watch like one percent of the clips that you put up. All right, fine. All right, so I've, I have found the tweet. You said on the third of March. Guys, I went a bit overboard and wrote a 2,500 word update about my personal and business goals for 2021. Lol. Check it out here if you like. And then the link. I'd like to unpack that a little bit. All right. Let's go for it. So there were two things that stood out to me about the tweets. Can you guess what they were? Overboard and lol. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Why, why do you think those stood out for me? I think overboard and lol should start for you because they, it sounds very apologetic. Mm. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think apologetic is a is a good word for it. Um, yeah, it's like a it's a it's a pattern that I think lots of people do, particularly when sort of publicizing something that they've just done. Mm. they'll you know they'll sort of do it in a very apologetic tone uh so you know a really common sort of uh way of, way of doing it is like if you if you've written something if you've recently made something or done something there's this weird phrase that people say which is so i did a thing <laughs> you know they'll say like so i did a thing and then they'll like link to whatever um you know whatever they've just done and why why did you do it i felt like I I probably felt some level of some level of discomfort at the blatant self promotion, and some dude, level of dude. Can I can I can I stop you there? <laughs> you literally <laughs> have a YouTube channel for a living, <laughs> and you self promote <laughs> like, or even on Twitter with your little clips and stuff. Like, how is it's, this different? Okay. <laughs> it's different because. Talking because writing 2,500 words about my own personal goals is like a different form of self-promotion than writing 2,500 words about how to be more productive. Oh, okay. Because it's, it's more like personal and self-serving almost. Yeah. It's like almost like a public journal. Okay. Public, size, pro, pu public private journal. And therefore, I felt like I felt, I, I, I felt the need to give a nod to the fact that I was self-aware about the fact that this is a self promoty type, a self promoty slash like type thing. Therefore the overboard and lol came into it. I see. If someone else who you followed, uh, I don't know, Tiago Forte, for example, if Tiago wrote a 2,500 word update about his personal and business goals for 2021 and he didn't, uh, signal his self awareness about how like self indulgent that is. Like, what would you think if if Tiago just like earnestly posts, "Hey guys, here it is, my twenty twenty one goals update." Let me know what you think. Like, would you think, "Oh man, what, what a prick"? Oh, oh no, how self indulgent. <laughs> <laughs> right, no self awareness there. Uh, no, I would just be like, "Okay, cool, click." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hmm. So do you, do you like stand by it, or do, do you think that was like a yeah, do you, do you stand by what you did? <laughs> no, it sounds like you've committed a heinous crime, which, which you, you have to be clear. <laughs> insincerity is, a, is the most heinous uh, of crimes. I'm not, I'm not sure insincerity is the word that I, was, uh, I would use. <laughs> Why not? Because you could be sincere about something while, while also recognizing that it's a little bit... It, while, while also recognizing that it's a little bit self-indulgent to write a 2,500 word blog post in public about your own personal goals. Uh, I think I was sincere, but not serious. I don't think you were sincere, mate. Okay. Why, why do you think I was not sincere? Because you felt the need to coat this in like a layer of not irony, but a layer of sort of, humor or something because you couldn't be earnest or that, uh, maybe we should google some definitions here uh earnest means resulting from or showing sincere and intense conviction sincere means 
Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, if that's sincere what means free, free from pretense or deceit. I feel like there was no pretense or deceit the... around it. There was just Sorry. The, 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 the strong conviction wasn't there. Okay. Okay. I guess you were sincere in the sense that you were genuinely insecure about this thing. And you were signaling the insecurity by saying the overboard and the law. So you were, right. you were like, you were being sincere in, in that oh, sense. Yeah, yeah. But I, <laughs> I'm always sincere in the things I do online, man. Um, but yeah, I guess like, do you stand by the insecurity? Like on the 2022 update, are you going to do the same thing? I think now, like if, like uh, now that I've done it a few times, like now that I've done it once, it will be less of a weird thing to okay. like for me to do in the future. But like, if like, okay, l let's imagine, let's imagine like pick a random, you know, a stereotypical hypothetical Twitter think boy that you you like to rail against. I think part I of why no, you rail, no, I don't, I don't rail against anyone to be clear. Fine. <laughs> okay, sure, but 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 let's pretend there is like you know a Twitter think boy who is yeah. tweeting like with conviction, fortune cookie tweets that yeah. are not based on any kind of personal experience, but they're, they're purely based on repackaging insights from Naval or James Clear. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I think I wouldn't want to do that. Like it's, that's not, that's not the impression that I want to give on the internet that I, I am the sort of person who has so much conviction about the, the secondhand experience that I will just put it out there as a tweet. I would I like you've the... made video. Haven't you made videos literally like these are the five takeaways I got from this book or whatever. Yeah. But the, like, like, like a video saying, Hey guys, I really enjoyed this book and here are five takeaways I got is different to consistency is more important than intensity. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay, fine. Like fine. I could tweet consistency is more important than intensity full stop, but it's just a different kind of vibe and 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 that's not me unless I feel like I've gained that insight from personal experience okay, okay. and then I can yeah. 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 And equally, yes, I could say, "Hey guys, here's my 2021 March goals update." Mm. Link. But I just think it's more it's more me to be like, "Hey guys, lol went a bit overboard. Here's my 21 <laughs> goals update if anyone wants to read it, lol." <laughs> Really? That's for you? <laughs> yeah. That's more authentic to who I am IRL than guys, here are my, here's my here's my goals update. Like in a in a social situation, I wouldn't just be like, right guys, I'm gonna update you about my goals. <laughs> <laughs> like, Dude, not twi a bit... twi Twitter isn't a social situation. Um, it kind of is. It's got it's got its own like in a way we're all signaling our personalities online. Okay. And I tend to be more apologetic about the way that I portray myself online than other people than other people might do. I think that's fine. Hmm. Let me think about that for a second. It's something I'm having to get over in terms of this book writing process. And like being unapologetic about being an internet guru <laughs> and being like a productivity guru or whatever. Right. Because I think Historically, I've been good at repackaging insights from other people, and I feel that I don't have any original ideas at all. And I feel like everything right. I do is just sort of taken from someone else with my own like occasional spin applied to it. Right. But speaking to the people who are kind of help, helping me helping me out on the book front, this is like a a suboptimal way of, of thinking now because I do have quote, original insights about the way that I live my life. And it's not entirely based on kind of what other people have said. And yeah. it's just recognizing that, okay, there is actually a layer of this is what I think and this, and these are my kind of firm beliefs. Mm. Whereas it's easy to hide behind, hey, this is what Cal Newport said. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. So now as I'm working with people to help craft the book proposal and, and the book and stuff, it's been a constant battle to be more okay with being with with having more conviction about things mm -hmm. and actually recognizing that my opinion is valid <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, i was i was saying this to my writing coach this week we were, we were talking about this and i was thinking and he was like why do you feel like your opinion isn't valid and i was like well because i'm writing a book about productivity and like you know if if elon musk were to write a book about productivity his opinion would be valid like i am not elon musk therefore my opinion on productivity is not valid Okay. It's like, mm, <laughs> I think we should unpack that a little bit. I think for me, the sort of alleged self-awareness and uh, bordering on imposter syndrome, bordering on kind of wanting to be 
wanting to not be seen as like a brash American with like huge conviction, like tweeting about stuff like American yeah, yeah, vibe. Yeah. Not yeah, wanting yeah. to be seen in that way because that feels not me. I think I probably take that too far when it comes to things like the book. Mm. I think I do an okay job of it on the YouTube channel because I'm comfortable enough on the, in, in the form of YouTube videos to know that what I say has value. Whereas yeah. when it comes to writing a book or writing blog posts, which are two things that I'm less used to. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, I guess they are different mediums. Yeah, I think partly why I was surprised was like, I, 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 I was kind of thinking, look, I'd understand this if it was coming from, if this was the first time someone has put themselves out there on the internet and they're kind of shy about it or insecure about it, whatever. And, and so they do that. Oh, so I did, uh, I did a thing or whatever to, to try and um, announce it. But I just thought it was weird coming from you because you've obviously been doing this a while, but you're saying that writing a blog post doesn't feel at all like making a YouTube video. Yes. Making a YouTube video, I, I made a YouTube video about my goals for 2021. I didn't need to hedge anything on there. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, whereas, yeah, the, the the medium of blog post, I think, was where the... Because it was just a bit different for me. Like, I, do, I don't write 2,000 word blog posts about about myself. <laughs> it's just not a thing. Okay. okay. So that made it feel like more of a, hey, you know, this is pushing the boat out rather than it being like a standard part of my life. Hmm. Did it feel more like revealing than making a, a YouTube video about the same topic. It did in a way it did because seeing stuff on paper is like very different to just sort of having a, it's like making a video about a topic that isn't like scripted. Like my goals one were like, wasn't scripted. Yeah. Making a video about that just kind of feels like chatting to a friend. It feels yeah. like not a big deal in the slightest. Yeah. Whereas putting it down on paper and publishing it as a, as a blog post <laughs> on a website feels more permanent more legit more like okay i actually have to think about this rather yeah. than I can just kind of say whatever the hell i want mm. so like i have no qualms about s s saying stuff on this podcast but if i were to write those things down i'd have to think harder about them yeah well, yeah for sure yeah i would need and, and and also just the medium of writing requires ideas to be more well thought out than the medium of podcast or the medium of video I think there's a perception that the medium of writing requires ideas to be like more well thought out. But I mean, certainly there are plenty of people who do more stream of conscious style, blogging, journaling, whatever. I don't think it has to be that way. But yeah, I do think there is something more like if you're, you know, like we're talking on the podcast or whatever, there is a, there's an understanding that the, the words are just like coming out of our mouths. We're not really thinking too much about this. Mm. But I think when you, when you decide to write something, unless unless explicitly you're like look this is a stream of consciousness thing yeah like i don't edit this blah 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 and, and i know some people do that and it's pretty it's pretty interesting unless unless you're actually doing that then you you are deliberately choosing all the words that you've said and <laughs> there is something revealing about every choice that you've made for, yeah. for every every one of those words in that piece <laughs> you know uh, okay. your soul is sort of is in there basically like it's very easy for me to say on a youtube video hey guys i'm trying to find a wife this year lol i'm going to call it my wife quest but putting yeah. that down on paper. <laughs> yeah. This year, yeah. I have decided to embark on the wife quest. Yeah, this dude <laughs> sat at his desk yeah. and wrote the words wife quest. <laughs> yeah, it's different. It's different for sure. Okay, that is interesting. Um, Speaking of, have you come across a book called The Rosie Project? No, what is it? Oh, it's really good. Um, I was listening to it this week slash last week and stayed up until like four in the morning just finishing it one night. It's apparently one of Bill Gates' favorite books. It's the story of this uh, genetics professor um, who has some variant of Asperger syndrome and how he's trying to find a wife. Uh, and he has this Whoa. thing called the wife project where he like, um, you know, sets up a questionnaire and does it. It's like remarkably relatable. I think, I think you would enjoy it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. It's really good. The Rosie project. The Rosie. And it's the, an audio book. The Rosie project. Huh? Audio book. I mean, it's, it's a book, but I listened to the audio book. Nice. Yeah, that sounds okay. great. I have two Audible credits sitting around, so I'll, um, nice. I'll use that next. Um, okay. Very good. Okay, so staying on this topic of like earnestness or sincerity hmm. in posting. Uh, yeah, I think like... I'm just going to scroll through my own tweets. <sighs> I think I like to think that I'm sort of authentic and sincere, but I do, I feel forces in directions 
like I'm I'm very wary of being a think boy on Twitter and I think I like I I steer too clear of, of mm. that because I I I just don't want don't like the idea of being thought of as a think boy. I think this is why you don't capitalize your tweets. I don't know about that. Okay, no, so <laughs> I I capitalize some of my tweets. Okay. So it de- it depends what I'm tweeting. If there look a lot some of what I tweet is like yeah, look, I, like some some of the stuff I tweet is like jokes and shit posts and things. Yeah. And not capitalizing those you know, it's it's yeah, part I mean, of that the medium. Sense. It's part of the medium for the, for like the more straight up stuff I tweet. For example, a week ago, I tweeted about like what do people mean when they say that they can feel the effects of coffee? Like that's not that's not like a joke. It's not a shit post. It's literally just me asking a question and interested to hear what people think. Okay. And so I'll. But you asking a in. question like asking a question is a different type of tweet than tweeting a statement. Okay. I'll, I mean, I can find you a statement. How do you find the balance between X and Y? Is an interview question that sounds sophisticated but rarely reveals useful answers. Yeah, that was a statement. I tweeted it with conviction. No, yeah, no, no, fair enough. no. Yeah, so look, I think, I think I broadly am fairly authentic, but I do feel I I do feel forces of like anti think boyness mm. for one, and I'm trying to think what would I be what would I be apologetic about. I think like I think when publicizing causal stuff on my personal Twitter account I I I sometimes feel this thing of like oh I, I need to like yeah basically what you were saying about needing to signal self-awareness that you're like shilling or whatever or self-promoting and I and I, I feel a bit of that but then I I I know I know I'm feeling that and I know it's stupid and then I just kind of ignore it and so like I don't know a week or two ago you know, we're hiring a bunch of people at Causal. I posted about it from my Twitter, from my personal Twitter. Uh, I just pretty straight up, you know. But I, but I felt the, I felt the force of like, oh, maybe I should, maybe I should throw a joke in there, <laughs> you know, or something. Yeah. I, did, I did feel it. I wonder if the throw the joke in there is the same. I wonder if it's the same mental process that runs for people who write hashtag blessed hashtag so grateful kind of thing as a way of tempering the inherent <laughs> self promote nature of a certain thing wait, wait wait do people use hashtag blessed and hashtag grateful non-ironically uh people on linkedin do yeah okay okay i i don't know what these posts look like um hang on let's think about this also, I have to I have to come clean. After the after the sincere and earnest um, post about causal hiring, I then reply. I then added a tweet to the, to the thread saying, <laughs> "Forgot to add one like equals one respect." <laughs> <laughs> and like, and, but no, I just just to defend myself here a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> By all means, I defend genuinely thought. <laughs> I genuinely I thought of it afterwards, and I genuinely thought it was funny. Like I don't. I don't think I was doing that in order to like signal self awareness or whatever. I ju- I just thought it was funny. <laughs> okay. Like just the, the phrase "one like equals one respect" came to mind. And I thought, oh, that's pretty funny. <laughs> so I yeah, just I just, promise you, Honor, I didn't think of it at the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it wasn't premeditated. <laughs> yeah. Um, what were you saying about hashtag grateful hashtag blessed on LinkedIn posts? I think l- like for example. Is it the same? So, like, for example, if I were to tweet, just got accepted into Harvard, Harvard Business School. Yeah. It's a different sort of tweet than just got accepted into Harvard Business School, lol, OMG, I can't believe it. Which is a different sort of tweet to just got accepted into Harvard Business School, so grateful for everyone who helped me on the, along the way, hashtag blessed. Not ironically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, I feel, the, the latter is more self-aware <laughs> or more... But wait, is, wait, wait, wait! Okay, hang on, sorry. The 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 latter two are more comfortable to tweet than just got accepted into Harvard Business School, which feels like pure, unadulterated brag. <laughs> <laughs> I think the brag needs to be adulterated by something. It needs to be tempered by some level of, oh, lol, can't believe it. Like, oh my god, so grateful, or ah, <laughs> or you know, whatever. I don't know. I mean, so I th- I think like, I don't think it necessarily needs to be a brag. You know, 
like part of social media is sharing what's going on with your life with other people who ostensibly claim, claim to care what, what's going on in your life because they follow you on social media. And so if there's a meaningful life update, like just got accepted into Harvard Business School, um, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe you're bragging by saying that, but maybe you're not. Maybe, maybe you're just sharing this. Maybe, this sort of but nice like most thing. people would feel more uncomfortable about b tweeting that than by following it up with a lol. OMG, I can't believe it. Or be like, <laughs> lol, I don't know how this happened. Or being like, embarrassed emoji, embarrassed emoji. Or you, you know. Let's talk about the blessed, the hashtag blessed angle of like, sure, so grateful. I think it just feels uncomfortable to some people. Well, I feel like it feels uncomfortable to most people to just make a genuinely clear statement, especially if that statement could signal things that you don't, you'd rather not signal like self-absorption, narcissism or bragging. Uh, okay. Yeah. Look, I agree. I, I get it. I obviously get it in this, in this case, like it would be a little bit weird just to, just to say, I just got exception to Harvard business school because like, if you think about, if you think about how, you know, what you, what you'd kind of be sharing with people there, you'd want to, sh you know, you, you want to share like how you feel about that. Like if, if you think about how you'd tell your friends that, like you'd, you'd share like the feelings you have about the thing rather mm. than just like, you know, delivering some information. Right. Mm. And so like, I don't think like, you know, a bunch of exclamation marks or like, OMG, can't believe it. I don't think that is necessarily like trying to signal the self-awareness i think that can that can just be like a really earnest you know i'm just super psyched that i got into harvard business school sure. um yeah i mean in that same sense me tweeting guys i, just, I went a bit overboard and wrote 2500 words about my goals lol that is signaling how i feel about the thing i did feel like i went overboard but like oh damn this blog post was longer than i thought it would be. i thought it'd be like 300 words and the lol bit is just sort of is, is signaling my genuine sort of slightly cringe response at doing the thing. Okay, so I think there's there's there's, there's different things that it's, it's worth separating here. I think what you the thing you did was relatively sincere in that you did feel insecure about this thing, and you were like, I okay, get okay, you don't like the word insecurity. What would you rather I say? Shy? I'm shy. Lol. In, 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 insecure is fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. You like you felt a little bit insecure about spade a spade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you felt a little bit insecure about the thing, the blog post, um, for reasons, and you were sort of signaling the insecurity by the overboard and the lull in the tweet. And in that sense, that was fine. And so the thing I was trying to get at was like, why are you feeling insecure? And do you stand by mm. that? And like, you know, mm. the discussing your feelings around that. And that, I don't stand by my insecurity. I'm not gonna <laughs> yeah. wear my insecurity on my sleeve. Uh, but okay, yeah. Okay. There was, so that, there, was, there was a feeling of insecurity, and that feeling of insecurity was signaled by the use of the word "lol" and "overboard." Yeah, in the tweet. Um, so that's one thing. I think, I think that's you know that's fine. It, you know, call it a spade a spade. You know, good on you for doing it. I think another phenomenon is more, is more around the forces that I uh, that I mentioned around like not wanting to be a think boy or whatever and um I think like if you if you look at how some people tweet there there's definitely like a certain manner to it in mm. terms of like um in terms of the tone and, and okay, things so like let's, that let's find some examples for the audience who might not be as familiar with certain bits of twitter like that you and I are I think there is a term, there's a term that like basically describes what I'm trying to get at, which is called poster's brain. Have you, have you heard this? No. What is that? Are you, are you familiar with the term posting or poster or like post, post as a... As distinct from page or... No, post as in like, it, like the, from the verb, like to post online. I mean, yeah, like, I got that that was what we were talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like... A poster is like a. Oh my! Let me. All right, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna try and find the Urban Dictionary. Okay, basically, I think if you spend enough time in whatever subcultures online, you mm. it'll it, it starts to rewire your brain a little bit in terms of what you think about, how you think about that thing, and how you interpret that thing, and how you communicate that thing, and so. If you, for example, like, 
there are a bunch of people on tech Twitter, for example, who post like really sort of, uh, <laughs> sort of like, uh, kind of like snarky, ironic takes about like tech stuff or whatever. And like that, that will have like a, a very certain tone and a very specific brand that, that that's coming across. And I think in real life, these people are probably not actually, you know, they're not like that. And and that's fine, but my point is that like the, there are these forces that um, sort of influence how you choose to come across online, and and yeah, I I I often feel if I'm like if I'm tweeting something, I feel like I need to coat it in some kind of joke or some sort of irony or something like that. Um just because wait does it feel weird just to like be sincere about it i can't remember I think it because, feels like it yeah, feels weird if you're <clears throat> if it's not currently part of your brand in a way like and i think that just comes from from practice like for example if naval or james clear were to tweet something they wouldn't you you wouldn't expect them to put like lol in it because they're just yeah. very seem seemingly comfortable with just giving advice and people resonate with their advice in that format and given that their twitter accounts are entirely full of that just giving advice it if it's part it's just part of the authenticity and the overall brand brand yeah. image whereas if you were to tweet consistency beats intensity <laughs> it would it would just be a little bit odd it would be yeah. not the sort of thing you would normally say and so you'd have to be like like guys this is not the no <laughs> this is not the sort of thing i normally say <laughs> but trust me because it's <laughs> <the> intensity <laughs> yeah <laughs> whereas if james clay was supposed to say <laughs> this is not the sort of thing i normally say <laughs> consistency beats intensity people would be like bro <laughs> If I were to make a video about how I'm getting in touch with my inner feelings to find my values, I would have to preface it with, look, guys, I know this is going to sound weird and I know I don't normally talk about this stuff, but dot, dot, dot. Whereas if at spiritual mind value were to, were to make a video about the same thing, it would be that there would be no need for prefacing. I see. Why would you feel the need to preface that? I mean, it's true yeah. that it's not normally the thing, you, normally the well, kind yeah. of thing you talk about. But why, why do you need to draw attention to that? Does it feel like you're sort of getting outside your lane or something? Or yeah, to signal that I'm going outside my lane. Hmm. And for the people that are like me, i.e., my audience, it's a case of like, okay, guys, look, this is not the stuff we we we, we normally think about. But 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 trust me on this. Bear with me. Watch this video. Watch it through to the end. Smash that like button, and you'll learn something at the end of it. Smash that like button. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Wait, was that a joke? Was that like a yes. touch <laughs> joke? <laughs> well, maybe this is just how you talk now. <laughs> yeah. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe. Conan has a really funny bit where, um, this is true of his podcast. Uh, he talks about how, how like sometimes when he's just hanging out socially at like a dinner or something, um, he, you know, he, he'll sometimes have to sort of, you know, take lead of the conversation if no one else is taking lead and, you know, he'll, he'll like entertain people. He'll tell some jokes and, and just by sort of instinct, if he tells a joke that gets some big laughs, he'll follow it up with, let's take a break. Don't go away. <laughs> because that's like what he, on his show, what he'd do is after you make a big joke, that's when you cut to the, the ad break and you'd say like, you know, we'll, we'll be back. Don't go away. <laughs> Yeah, I have, I have a similar tick in real life where it's like, if I say something and then I kind of stump, and then I stumble on my words, I will kind of stop, do a little clap. Wait, do you actually? And then do the thing. <laughs> do you actually do that in real life at all? Or like as a joke or whatever? Uh, occasionally I do it as a joke. I think there was one time where I did it just like accidentally. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. Wow, when was that? I, be mortified. I can't remember. This was like probably about a year ago. And then I had to, I, I, I feel it was because I was talking to another YouTuber. Um, <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I feel like it was, it was on a topic that I usually talk about in videos. 
<laughs> and so just like you know this little clap or like oops <laughs> and, and then you've got to leave that little pause so that the editor can then like because it's really hard to cut well, yeah. you know someone saying <laughs> yeah i can just imagine you, you sort of uh, interjecting with angus let's cut the last 10 seconds out <laughs> like in the in the middle of a conversation <laughs> yeah <laughs> you're like whoops and can we have an emoji coming up over there and then a lower third in the middle yeah <laughs> Nice. I think I think we talk about like sincerity and earnestness on, on social media. Um, yeah, I just I think like you don't have to be sincere. I think like a lot of people on Twitter certainly are playing some kind of character. Like a lot of the really funny people are definitely like playing some kind of character, and they won't be like that in real life. And that's fine. Like it's, it's fine to do that. But. I think there's just like a general fear of being earnest and sincere, man. It's just, it's hard. It's hard for us to do. Yeah. And it shouldn't be that way. Why is it? Why do you think it's hard? I feel like it's, it's hmm. Is it just like, is it similar to that? Some vulnerability. The, yeah. The fear, fear, fear of putting ourselves out there. Episode two or four two. or whatever it was of the this pod. Um, where it takes a level of, yeah, vulnerability, confidence. And a, a level of, I don't care what people think. A level of, I'm open to be, being criticized for this. I think the the fear of being sincere and earnest is sort of sort of like hedging, <laughs> where mm. if you've shown that, lol, I wasn't taking this, I, I wasn't really, t you know, I wasn't really trying, lol. Um, yeah, yeah. You are less likely to be lambasted <laughs> by the commenters for having the audacity to try. The, the the crabs in the barrel are less likely to drag you down if you <laughs> if you don't look as if you're making a sincere effort to jump out of the barrel right if you just sort of look up and kind of scratch occasionally and then you occasionally kind of being you know go up the barrel look around a bit and come back yeah. down again <laughs> you're not really pushing you're not really rocking the boat i see yeah but i feel, I feel like this is why starting a youtube channel is quite hard um yeah in a way more so than starting a podcast or writing a blog is hard because you're putting more of yourself out there on the YouTube channel because of like your face. Yeah. Cause it's like your face and stuff. And so many people are like, Oh, I don't, I have a discomfort with showing my face online. Yeah, I have a yeah, discomfort yeah. with even revealing my true name online. And yeah. I want to do YouTube, but I don't want to show my face. It's like a very normal thing. Really? Oh, okay. yeah. It's like a huge insecurity of a lot of people. It's also a big part of, um, I, I, I hear it a lot from, I mean, I, I hear it a lot from like girls with Muslim sounding names and you can kind of see why that would be the case. What do you mean? As in like, I, I, I most of the messages I've got on, on Instagram from people saying, Hey, I want it or email. I want advice for starting a YouTube channel, but I don't want to show my face has been the name yeah. of a, a, it has been a Muslim girl name. Okay. Which kind of makes sense given the background of like conservatism and the background of like, well, you know, <laughs> the, the, all, all of the various baggages associated with that. Hmm. Yeah, I guess so. Do you, have, do you dig into like why, I why they want to start a YouTube channel? <laughs> oh, okay, right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but like, do you... My thing on the my thing on the name front is, is, is usually, I don't, I don't usually dig in. Like if I were doing a one-on-one -on -one consultation with someone, I would dig into it. Yeah. Um, I think, who was it I was speaking to? Uh, one of my friends from uni is a Muslim girl uh, and said that I don't want my face to be on a YouTube channel and yet was okay with her face being on other people's YouTube channels. So I was like really trying to dig into this being like, okay, what's that's interesting. Yeah. What, what's going on here to, to the point that she would, that she got like upset was like, I don't want to talk about this anymore. Just like drop it. I was like, wow. Okay. <laughs> hmm. I think like, I think there is judgment, you know, like people would judge these things in a certain way. Mm. Like I, I can imagine if you're like a Muslim girl from a conservative background, you know, people might, might sort of judge you if you, um, you know, have a, have a YouTube channel where you put your face out there. And then, you know, people might be like, well, well what is she doing? You know, what, 
what is this? Like, it's, it's not the proper thing or, or something like that. Mm. But like, I, I, yeah, I think like there is, there is definitely a lot of judgment. It's, it's not like, it's not like people are crazy and it's just all in their head that like, this is scary mm. or whatever. I, I think there are actually, there, are, you know, there is actually judgment and consequences that can come from these things mm. in, uh, in many instances. Yeah, I, th- I, I feel like a part of it as well is, like, in the last 12 months, I know, like, lots and lots of people who have started YouTube channels or started, like, Instagram IGTV accounts where they're, like, talking about themselves and, you know, this sort of stuff. And I have been in conversations where people that I know have been hating on those to a degree that, like, oh, my God, did you see... Yeah, John yeah. slash Jane. Usually it's Jane. Did you see that Jane has started a YouTube channel? Oh my God! Like, what? What? what what's yeah. going on there? So Why is cringe, everyone starting yeah. it? You know? Or yeah. did you see that thing that Jane posted on Instagram? Lol, <laughs> it sounded so cringe. And I always yeah yeah feel I think like, people yeah oh. <laughs> people do say this stuff yeah yeah, and I there is a, a big element like it's I think I think it's 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 easy to over over index on the thing of you know don't worry about what other people think of you because they just don't spend any time thinking of you but if if we're the sort of person who knows people slash are the sort of person who would look at our friend jane starting instagram and, and answering questions about x and thinking oh then yeah, who, who it's going to be a lot it? harder for us to do the same thing and put ourselves out there in any capacity because yeah. we know that there is a human tendency to judge mm. Whereas if you are, and, and I would argue this is the, the correct way to live, if you see your friend posting something on Instagram and your response is, well done, mate, as opposed to, oh, what's going on? That, yeah. That's a much more conducive way of actually being, a, being more okay with taking risks and putting yourself out there yourself. Yeah. Yeah, I think the, crab, the crabs in the barrel analogy is just really good. I think we talked about this on episode two um, as well, where it, it feels weird to watch somebody you know sort of change in some way Hmm. and yeah people people don't like it man the analogy that comes to mind is like the phenomenon the 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 phenomenon of slut shaming yeah yeah and the equivalent for guys which is the oh he must be gay um is that the equivalent for guys yeah 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 i mean it's 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 not entirely equivalent but Okay. There, fine. Was, there, there was there was this great thing I was I was reading about like that was comparing and c- contrasting these two phenomena, and they're both based around feeling threatened by this other person, feeling threatened by their generally higher than yours pr- prowess in the sexual marketplace, and therefore trying to invalidate that by either saying they're a slut or by saying they're gay. I think. Oh, I see. I feel they talk about this in the Elephant in the Brain or in in one of these books that we've discussed recently. And about how this is like a psychological defense mechanism against like, oh, you know, she has dressed up nicely and looks good. Therefore, she is a slut or he has dressed up nicely and look good and looks good as attractive and charismatic. Therefore, he's gay. Yeah, therefore, yeah. I don't have to, you know, we're, yeah, not, yeah, yeah. we're not competing in that market anymore. I'm going to I'm going to remove them from the from the competition in my in my own head. Yeah. yeah. I think it's kind of it, it's it's somewhat analogous when it's like, oh, she has started a YouTube channel slash Instagram page. Oh, that's so cringe. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Like probably there is an element of, I kind of wish I could do the same, mm. um, and an element of like, oh, I don't want to have to think about the fact that I kind of wish I could do the same. Therefore, I'm going to tear this person down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even though they are the proverbial pro- proverbial man in the arena. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. Actually, I think that yeah, that's a good analogy. I I wonder like, with the current sort of generation of <clears throat> teens and so on, where you know, everyone wants to be a YouTuber or whatever. It's like, you know, it's, it's like everyone like watches this stuff. Every, everyone is like into this stuff. I wonder if there's the same amount of baggage attached to it. Like, is it, is it weird and cringe if like your mates, you know, if, if you're like 12 years old and your mate is starting to, you know, dance stream Fortnite or something or dance <laughs> yeah. to, yeah. Is that, is that like weird and cringe or hmm. is that, is it sort of normalized? It's, it's, I don't know. It's like, <laughs> It's like if you're at university and someone applies for an internship, like it's it's not cringe, mate. <laughs> like, Whereas, like, if you're in secondary school and someone applies for an internship, yeah, that's maybe cringe. <laughs> a bit more cringe yeah. Like yeah, if if um, 
if if a sort of young teen is getting into TikTok or whatever, like do, do what what other other would their peer groups sort of drag them down, or is it just like so normal and so valued that it's like, yeah, you know, they're doing the thing, good for them. I remember I was I was listening to a Charlie D'Amelio interview once where <laughs> this the, this question was asked and and she was like yeah I started dancing on TikTok and I was really scared I I, I didn't want to tell anyone that I started doing it and so even then which which would have been like two year two years ago probably yeah there yeah, was, that was an element of this is cringe no but look a lot of, I mean a lot has changed in two years <laughs> yeah no, for right. example we now know who Charlie D'Amelio is <laughs> yeah so um, yeah I think a lot has changed in those two years especially mm. with TikTok. Hmm. Yeah, I wonder if that would be considered cringe. Uh, if you are a, a teenager and uh, you have any thoughts about what we're talking about, would would be curious. Like if your friend started YouTube or TikTok or Twitch, would would that be cringe until they reach some level of scale, or would that be like fairly normal and um, esteemed thing to do? I genuinely think we should we should get a kid on the podcast who understands social dynamics, this the sort of social media dynamics. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and yeah. And just just like un unpack this a little bit more because I'd love yeah. to hear from like a thirteen year old about like what is the, you know <laughs> what's life on the ground like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How's the weather down there? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How do the real people live these days? Yeah, I feel like we should uh, we should just have like an an annual update from like <laughs> what yeah. are the kids up to now. I mean, I think things are changing so quickly. It probably needs to be like a quarterly up update. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Every quarter we have a, we have a 13 year old come on the podcast. And we just have like a panel. Yeah. <laughs> um, one th well, on, on that note, w one thing that I, on a, on a somewhat related note, I, I got an email a few weeks ago from a YouTuber with like, I don't know, 400K subs or something like that who wanted to have a chat just because she was like, hey, you know, I, I make videos and I'm kind of in the sim similar productivity type thing. I'd love to have a chat with you and just, you know, share some ideas. I was like, cool. Hopped on a Zoom call with her. Turned out she's 14. And it was like a very, very like standard, you know, good vibes, YouTuber talking to YouTuber conversation. Yeah. But when my, when like some of my team members saw this and when Sheen saw this, I was, I was talking to a 14 year old YouTuber of a Zoom there was like a real response of, oh my God, you can't possibly do that. How, you know, how can you speak to someone under 18 over Zoom? And I was, mm. I was completely baffled by this. I was like, what the hell? <laughs> like, yeah, this is a YouTuber who has reached out where we're sharing advice about YouTube. And he was like, yeah, but you know, anything could happen over a Zoom call. Like what the hell is going to happen over a Zoom call? Like, right. I, 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 I was very surprised by the, the, the very strong negative reaction that like Sheen and one of my other team members, who's also a girl, had had to this. Did you dig into it? Like, what what, what were their thoughts? Um, I, I think it would be, it would have been different if you're if you're proactively reaching out to fourteen year olds to have Zoom calls, but that's not what's going on, right? Like, the they reached out to you, you agreed to a Zoom call. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I think it was it was it, it was hard to get at like what the actual problem with this was, other than no, Ali, this is wrong. Um, think about think about your image, you know. She could say anything about you. She could say that something inappropriate happened over the Zoom call. Yeah. Or words to that effect. Um, and therefore, you do not want to, therefore, you want to have a chaperone when you're, if you're, if you are on a Zoom call with anyone under the age of 18. It just seemed like, right. a, a, I don't know. Is it, is it reasonable? Is it, a, is it weird? It's, it, it seems absurd to me to have that, that restriction. Yeah. Uh, but. So it was more from the angle of like, you should protect yourself in this situation from like from false know, allegations. Yeah, that was that was that, 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 that was the angle. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you should be. Maybe you should protect that. I have no idea. Yeah. I don't know. It's, it's I was thinking about world you know, out there. Exactly. The 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 automatic Zoom call recording feature. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but then also being like, okay, look, this might be weird that I'm recording the Zoom call, but <laughs> <laughs> like, trust me. <laughs> This is what this is what my team say I should do, just in yeah. case. I don't know. That is interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I had a chat with a, I think I think a fourteen year old boy a couple of months ago. He listened to the podcast and stuff and wanted to yeah, talk about things. I, I didn't feel um I didn't have anyone around me saying that, that was a weird thing to do or that I shouldn't be doing that. Mm. Um yeah.
I think it's fine. If it was a 14-year-old girl, do you think that would have been a different response? Possibly. Yeah. Worry about this a little bit. I mean, I, I'm I'm surprised at your openness to like going on like a date with someone who slides into your DMs who's like a complete rando. Mm. Because I mean, For especially at, you, over eighteen. Yeah, sure. Especially at like your your scale. Mm. I don't know. It just seems very easy to get caught up in to get caught up in a dodgy situation. I mean, I, I've, I've had a, 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 a few situations like that where, you know, someone who in, enjoys my work online, you know, slides into the DMs, wants to get to know each other better, go on a date or whatever. And there is definitely a level of hesitation there because there's absolutely no social proof around um, like who this person is you know, what their intentions might be and so on. Um, I think like if you meet someone in real life, it's typically through some kind of, you know, social, social connection, whether that's like through mutual friends at a party, through you know, work, whatever. Mm. There's, there's always some social okay. fabric. Proof of work. <laughs> yeah, there's proof of work. There's like some social fabric where you know that there is going to be a cost if like <laughs> someone does something stupid here, like there's going to yeah. be a social cost to it. But mm. when it's like a complete rando and you have no, there's no social fabric connecting you and you have like no sense of their sort of, yeah, anything about them, mm. then there isn't really a cost for someone to do something stupid, um, mm. whatever that, whatever that, that might entail. And so if I definitely have a lot of hesitation around that and I'm surprised at how little hesitation you seem to have around that. What do you what do you mean? Like, is it not somewhat equivalent to let's say meeting someone while you're on holiday somewhere where you're both in like a hostel together? There's no real social fabric connecting you other than the fact that you have, happen to have stumbled like stumbled into the same hostel. Um, yeah, I guess I guess that's different because it's more like it's because more sort of symmetric. Yeah, and and serendipitous. Uh, whereas yeah. in the other scenario. Yeah. And like, I mean, the kind of thing... Oh, sorry, go on. There's a, good, uh, there's a good story I came across, which is that um, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was someone talking about like fame and people actively reaching out to you and how, how you know whether someone is a scammer. And yeah. the, the thought experiment or the story was that, look, if you were to walk into any Starbucks and you were to give your car keys to someone and say hey i need to go to the toilet can you look after my car keys <laughs> yeah they would do it <laughs> like yeah yeah, yeah. You could, because people are nice mm. but if someone were to come up to you and say hey i'm gonna look after <laughs> your car keys <laughs> at that point you've so much you've so <laughs> you're so nailed down into the sort of you're not that population average of people are people yeah, are nice yeah. no, no longer applies in that situation yeah and so i sometimes think about that in the in the sense of if someone's actively outreaching to me or you and saying hey i want to go on a date the chances that they are weird are increased relative to the population average. Whereas, whereas if I were to say to a random person on the street, hey, would you like to go on a date? Chances are they're a normal person. Yeah, and it, it's tricky because I, I don't want to discourage people reaching out to other people on the internet. Like, I think it's a great thing. I think like more people should do <laughs> it. Get more DMs, man. <laughs> <laughs> Keep sliding into my DMs, lady. <laughs> um, no, but like <clears throat> it's... I think it's something that people feel weird about naturally. Like, you know, in a lot of the DMs I get, particularly from, say, like a girl who wants to meet up, mm. it, it usually starts off with, look, I know this is really weird. I hope this isn't creepy. Like, there's like so much caveating around that. And I think that's unnecessary. And I think there shouldn't be. And people shouldn't feel weird about it. But I think like, from the receiving point of view, there is definitely like a higher likelihood of, and so Wait, someone says, I know this is weird. It just, I guess, like yeah, a, I guess maybe that helps. Yeah. I mean, I mean that actually does help. The, the, this is like a standard thing in like the pickup artist <laughs> literature in that if you're approaching a girl on the street and saying, Hey, I think you're cute. And do you want to go on a date? That is weird. Like that is not socially normal. And therefore right, right. you do have to signal and be like, look, this is totally random, but dot, dot, dot. Yeah. You have to acknowledge well, that this is, a you have to acknowledge the weirdness of the situation to show that yeah. you have some level of like social skills and you're not just a complete, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fine. Disregarding the, the the fabric of society. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in your 
yeah, I mean, in in your case, I'd just be like concerned that, you know, let's say like you know you 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 know someone slides into your DMs, you go on a few dates or whatever, and things don't end up working out for whatever reason, you know, things go south. You know, it, even among like you know reasonable and compassionate people, there's plenty of instances where, you know, when a relationship ends there is some level of animosity from one side towards the other. Um, sometimes I'm sure, I'm sure it's warranted in some cases. I'm sure it's not warranted in some cases. And I would be worried about the idea of like, if I were a public figure like you, if I had like, you know, gone on a bunch of dates with someone, things didn't work out. I would be worried that if there is some level of animosity between us, they now have, I don't know, like, text messages and things sent from Ali Abdal, <laughs> the YouTube guy. <laughs> and, you know, that's a, it's, it's a scary thing. Cause like they can do what they, they could post those on Twitter. They can, you know, all sorts of things. Right. Mm. I would be really concerned about that. Um, on the text messaging thing, it does cross my mind. Yeah. So I, I, I try and keep my text messaging game to a minimum. <laughs> <laughs> For safety. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, I'm going to avoid making any particularly risque jokes over a text message. <laughs> right, right. Um, and yeah, I, 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 I think I am, I am conscious about the kind of screen, screenshot culture. Yeah, uh, yeah. Oh mate, I saw the funniest. Uh, I saw the funniest uh, Instagram thing. Uh, it was. <laughs> it's a it's a picture of a guy kind of tapping on his forehead, like you know, telling you to sort of be smart. <laughs> and mm -hmm. the caption is: "Before you enter her DM, think about how it would look as a screenshot." <laughs> <laughs> so good. Nice. <laughs> so true. Yeah, like that's the only extent to which I I, I think about this. Yeah. Okay. I think I, that's, I, a, that's a sensible thing. I feel like overall, uh, this is something that Tim Ferriss talked about. He he wrote like a very interesting blog post a few months ago called "Why Like Eight Reasons Why You Shouldn't Get Famous," and about how mm. all of the like tons and tons of issues that he's had um, in terms of like in in the dating world, where like you know a journalist will pose as like someone wanting to date him to try and get like dirt on him and write an article about it that hey, I went on a date with Tim Ferriss is what it was like, and yeah. he, you know like that level of stuff. Oh hell yeah. And he said that for a long time, it just like sort of made him yeah, so I'd, I'd be terrified. Of, yeah, yeah, opening himself up to anyone or anything just because like, what if it's a, you know, undercover yeah. journalist? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, the, yeah, he, the, the, there was even well, a thing with him where he was saying that he travels under an alias uh, and he books his flights under like a fake name and, and, and hotels under a fake name and stuff like that. And one time he landed in some country where there was a taxi driver with Timothy Ferris written on it. And he immediately knew that that could that was definitely a kidnapping because he never he didn't use the real name for the actual oh taxi that he hired, <laughs> <laughs> um, and so as soon as he saw that he just like went straight back into the thingy like and like called security and blah blah blah. Um, Shit, so it's all like feels kind of scary, but I don't know. Yeah, he mentioned on his recent episode with um, with Kevin Rose, who's like a old time friend of his, where Kevin was actually interviewing Tim on Tim's podcast. Mm -hmm. He said that like when eighty when eighty percent of the people who you meet have already Googled your name, it's just I, I think I think the phrase he used was fucking weird. <laughs> when like you know you know that eighty percent of people you you meet in real life like know who you are and will have Googled your name. Um mm. it's just like a very strange place to be. Hmm. Yeah, that is interesting. Like i I went on Hmm. Like sometime last year, I went on a few dates with someone from Hinge and it's like uh, hard to know to what extent they've Googled my name <laughs> right? Um, yeah. uh, uh, to, to the point where, you know, it was, it was, I think the question was something like, so what's your plan for the rest of the day? I was like, yeah, I'm going to, I've got to go home and, you know, filming, filming a video about, about a thing, about, about some topic. And she was like, oh yeah, I saw that you did that. <laughs> like, uh -oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, so but it, but it also feels weird to bring it up in, in a sense of 
Yeah, so I don't know if you've seen, but like I'm, I'm, yeah. I make, I make YouTube videos, and yeah, uh, like, I'm, I'm, I'm a big deal. And how yeah. much of that are you aware of? <laughs> you exactly know? that kind of vibe, and sort of just, just trying to, trying to put a feeler out there. Yeah, yeah. Because, like, the internet thing is such a big part of my life that it's almost hard to talk about stuff without bringing it in, yeah. in some yeah. capacity. Um, but like being too coy about it, just sort of being too casual and mentioning it, or I always feel like, am I? Do they think that I'm assuming that they will have seen that they would have seen right, the video? Right. That they were <laughs> yeah. about? Slash, would I like if I knew for a fact they didn't, they hadn't? What I would have given more context about this. Right, right, yeah. But if I do now give the context about this, it signals that hey, you know, I take myself too seriously, you know. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a YouTube channel, you know. <laughs> it's a little bit odd, but it's it's kind of funny. The price of fame, mate. The price of fame. Exactly. All right, I just got a calendar notification for a call in 10 minutes. So I think we should wrap this up. Nice. Um, um, we'll read out a review. I'm going to mint my own NFT next week. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't actually understand that stuff. What is it? <laughs> uh, no, me neither. Actually, I'm, gonna, no. I, I'm okay. going to understand it and then mint an NFT about it and then make a video about it. Uh, nice. uh, yeah, I don't know if you know, but I, I, I make videos on YouTube. <laughs> uh... All right, here's a nice review about you. It's entitled Ali Abdal is my guy. Five star reviews, literally the best podcaster and the goat. And did I read this out last time? I feel like we I've heard this one before. Unless okay. the guys okay. copied and pasted it. All right, next one's about me then. Fine. And the title is <laughs> Tame War. The body is is funny. Five star review. <laughs> Thank you to uh, not alone anymore. Wait, the that was it. Tame War, the body is funny. No, no, the title of the review was Tame War. The body, the content was is funny. Oh, like Tame War is funny, <laughs> not Tame War the body. Tame has a funny body. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm get bored with that. Speaking of, uh, I recently got one of these, uh, these bad boys. <laughs> what is that? An hourglass? Yeah. What's funny about, why is that relevant? I feel like, it, 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 isn't this something you often complain about that you have an hourglass figure? Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> I thought wow. you were going to clock on that. <laughs> Just announce that to the world, why don't yeah, you? Yeah, I'd explain the joke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I uh, I used to be insecure about my hourglass figure. Mm. I'm okay with it now. Nice. All right. All right. Um, cool. Wrap this up. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time. That's it for this week. Thank you for listening. If you like this episode, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or on the Apple Podcasts website if you're not using an iPhone. There's a link in the show notes. If you've got any thoughts on this episode or any ideas for new podcast topics, we'd love to get an audio message from you with your conundrum, question, or just anything that we could discuss. Yeah, if you're up for having your voice played on the podcast and your question being the springboard for our discussion, email us an audio file mp3 or voice note to hi at notoverthinking.com. If you've got thoughts but you'd rather not have your voice played publicly, that's fine as well. Tweet or DM us at nOverthinking on Twitter, please. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time.